Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my broadcast. My name is Diana Hooper, and I'm a theoretical physicist currently based at the ULB over in Belgium. Hey, Anjin, first, nice to see you. Thank you for joining. So I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm currently doing my postdoc, which means I've already completed a PhD, and I'm now at that kind of limbo stage in between being a PhD student and potentially being a professor one day. Hey, Robert, thank you for joining, and thank you for the Stay Safe Award. I really appreciate it, and thank you for the Super Heart Award. Thank you so much. And Scott, welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you over on Hats as well. Thank you, everybody who's joining. Welcome to anybody who's new, and welcome back to any of my regulars. So yeah, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I study cosmology which means I get to study the universe, the contents of the universe, everything inside, how the universe behaves, you know, what the universe is made of, super fun questions to answer. And I love sharing my research and, and physics and science in general with everybody. So I jump on HAPS frequently, about once a week, to try to answer any questions people have about the universe, anything you've ever wanted to know about black holes, about dark matter, about space, about time, might not have all the answers, especially if we get into philosophical discussions like what is time, but they're fun questions to try to answer, and I will do my best to try to answer any questions you all have. You can ask away, I will try to answer. Hey David, thank you for being here and thank you for the high award. Nice to see you, David. You have an idea, Scott, hear me out. How about in honor of Mother's Day in the US at least you talk about blue doors? You see, I don't I don't get why blue doors are, are related to Mother's Day. And you know, it's not Mother's Day in Germany, which is where I currently am. Actually, yes, sorry, it is Mother's Day in Germany. I can't even use that excuse. It's not Mother's Day in, in um, the UK, I believe. So I'm using that as my excuse. I just don't see the connection between blue doors and Mother's Day. Sorry, Scott, you're not getting your blue dwarf topic today. But I will do that maybe at some point, perhaps in the future. But I do actually have a broadcast, a topic plan for today's broadcast. I am happy, of course, to answer. Am I speaking faster than usual? I feel like I'm speaking faster than usual. That happens. Deep breath, slow down. Yeah, it's not here. Mother's Day was early in the year. Yes, it's actually different in like every country. Like in Spain, it was last week. In Germany, it's this week. In Belgium, I actually have no idea when it is. So like every country has their own, you just need a list to keep, to keep keep an eye on all of them. But you know, every day should be Mother's Day because mothers are awesome. So why not celebrate mothers always? Don't, don't forget about them the rest of the year. So I saw there was already a question from Robert of what have you been researching this week? I, I like that question. Thank you for that question. And thank you for the super heart of word. So uh, what have I been researching this week? Um, actually not so much. Between Wednesday and Friday this week, I was at a really, really nice conference, completely remote. This was the UCAT Symposium, so it's the European-wide com community of astroparticle theory, astroparticle physics theorists, cosmologists. So basically, a lot of people in my field and connected fields came together. I think there were over 600 participants at the conference. And it was a three-day gathering, completely virtual, but a three-day kind of summary of everything going on in the field. Very early career researchers got to give like a five minute talk. This was for PhD students. A lot of them did really stepped up and did a, an amazing five minute talk. Then we had kind of intermediate stage researchers giving more detailed presentations about current topics. And then very experienced expert senior researchers wrapping up the week with a summary of what's going on in these different fields and what can we help for the next 10 years. It was an amazing conference. It was a ridiculously intense program. We actually had 71 talks in the space of three days. It was a ridiculously intense program, but it was absolutely amazing. I learned a lot. My brain was completely frazzled by the end. So you asked me, what have I been researching this week? Actually, actually not much because I've been busy this week um, at this conference. It just wiped me out for most of the week. What is a cosmologist? You know, great question, Heavenly. That is a great question. I say I'm a cosmologist, so you need to ask what is a cosmologist? So a cosmologist is somebody who studies the cosmos. Cosmologist is formed of cosmo, log, cosmologist. So logist is the one who studies something, and cosmo comes from the cosmos. So I'm basically a theoretical physicist. I have a PhD in theoretical physics, and my speciality is the universe. So I get to answer the fun questions of like, what is the universe made of? How old is the universe? What is inside the universe? How do we know all of these questions? You know, how do we how do we go about answering these questions? So cosmologist is a theoretical physicist who specializes in trying to understand the universe. 
Of course, it's a big topic. We can't hope to understand everything, at least not individually. So I specifically try to understand the mysterious part of the universe that we cannot see. So we know that our universe has three main components, everything we see, everything we're accustomed to, everything we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. This is made up of normal matter, and it only accounts for 5% of the observable universe. There's another 25% <coughs> in the form of dark matter. Now, dark matter is this real type of matter that doesn't interact via the electromagnetic force, which means it doesn't emit light, it doesn't reflect light, it's basically invisible. But it does interact via the gravitational force, which means we can still feel its presence even if we cannot see it. And this accounts for 25% of the energy content of the observable universe. And the remaining 70% is in the form of dark energy. Dark energy is this weird type of energy that is driving the accelerated expansion of the universe, and that's pretty much everything we know about it. So my job is to try to understand this 25% that is in the form of dark matter. So, <coughs> got something stuck in my throat, should clear up in a minute, okay. So, you've actually, all of you have set this up perfectly, the question of what is the cosmology has really allowed me to set up what I want to talk about today. So I've mentioned that we know how old the universe is, we know the composition of the universe, we know the ingredients of the universe. So of course the big question is, how do we know these things? How can we know that the universe has 25% of a type of matter that we can't even see? How do we know that the universe is 13.82 billion years old? And these are very valid questions. Now, often when you do science, what you like to do is you, you go to a lab and you have your sample or your species or whatever it is you're studying. You might put it under a microscope. You might poke it with a stick and see what happens. Now, this is quite hard to do with the universe, right? How do you take the universe and put it in your lab? How do, how do you take the universe and cut it into pieces and, and poke it? it? It's rather difficult to do because we are part of the universe and the universe is kind of big. So... It's very, very difficult to, to um, study the universe. But I want to tell you, before getting to, I am going to build up to how we know about this, but that's going to be kind of the end answer. People who know me, who attend the broadcast regularly, know what I'm going to build up to. It's already been mentioned here in the comments. But I'm going to build up to how we really know the answer to these questions. What tells us the composition of the universe? So I want to tell you a story about what was happening inside the universe about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, at this point, you have kind of a soup of particles in the universe. The main particles you have at this point are protons. Now, you might have heard of protons as being kind of the, the building blocks of most atoms. Every atom has protons, neutrons, and electrons. These protons and neutrons are formed up of quarks. These are small subatomic particles that come together to form protons and neutrons. So every atom is formed up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So in the early universe, yeah, spoiler alert, but don't worry, everybody who's followed me regularly knows that I'm going to build up to the CMB. We're going to get there, but follow me on this journey first. So in the early universe, we have protons, we have electrons, we have photons, which are particles of light, and we have dark matter kind of just doing its own thing there. Dark matter doesn't interact with the other species. We don't need to really care about it. So every atom except hydrogen, yes, sorry, hydrogen just has protons and electrons. Hydrogen does not actually have any neutrons, of course. Yes, valid, very valid point there, Scott, thank you. So the three main, the three main species we need to worry about because dark matter is just doing its own thing. Three main things we need to worry about are protons, electrons, and photons. Now in the early universe, these were constantly interacting. The protons could interact with with the electrons, the electrons could interact with the, with the photons. They're just constantly bouncing off of each other. Imagine you've thrown around a bunch of balls and they just bump into each other and move on. They might absorb an electron emitted. You know, these are just constantly interacting, bumping into each other, basically constantly playing about all together. Um, this means that they can't really travel far. I, I know now we are we are in uh, lockdown times and we're not used to seeing other people. But imagine that the pre-lockdown times, if you're in a concert venue and it's full of people, I know that sounds scary now, but you're in a concert hall full of people and you want to get to the other side. It's going to be very difficult with all the people around, especially if they're all people you know, because you'll take two steps and somebody will be like, hey, how are you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. Take another two steps, you speak to somebody else. 
It takes you quite a while to get through this crowded hall. Of course, if there are no people around, it's much faster. So this was what was happening in the early universe. The photons, the protons, and the electrons were constantly bumping into each other, slowing down. None of them could really travel far in the universe. Now, the universe has always been expanding, and because of this expansion, it's also been gradually cooling down. So as the universe cools down, it actually becomes more favorable for the universe to stick the electrons and the protons together. So at some point, instead of bumping off of each other, they're actually going to come together and form an atom. And the this will become a hydrogen atom. So the idea is the proton and the electron come together. And at this point, you need a lot of energy to separate them again. And the universe no longer has this spare energy because it's gradually cooling down. It doesn't have the required temperature to pull these apart again. So instead of having the protons, photons, and electrons constantly bumping off of each other, the electrons and the protons come together and decide, you know, we're just going to kind of stay here. They bind to form the first hydrogen atoms in the universe, not the first, sorry. Yes, they come together to form the first actual hydrogen atoms in the universe. And then you have the proton, the photons, sorry, the particles of light, the photons. Now these photons can no longer bump into the other two particles. When you say cooling down, is it actually getting colder overall, or is it just the same heat spread out wider? That is a great question, David, that is a great question. It really is because of the expansion, the energy is kind of dissipating over a larger volume, so to speak, so the temperature does gradually decrease. So it's not directly that it's just getting colder, though that is also at play, but it is because you have this higher volume, this bigger volume, the energy is gradually decreasing as well. The temperature is decreasing. So the universe is gradually cooling down. In the very, very early universe, it was ridiculously hot. Now it's kind of chilly out in space. <coughs> so the, the protons and the electrons combine together to form these initial hydrogen atoms. And now the photons can't really talk to them. So imagine if, if there's a group of three people, one, two of them suddenly get together as a couple. Now, in there, unless they're in a polygamous relationship, usually the third one gets kind of left out and becomes the third wheel. So this is what happened to the photons in the early universe. They kind of became the third wheel. They could no longer bump into the electrons and the hydrogen, because the electrons and the protons, because they were busy doing their own thing. So at this point, it's now 380,000 years after the Big Bang, 380,000 years into the history of the universe. And at this point, or the, the known history of the universe, let's phrase it like that. And at this point, these photons are going to break away and start traveling freely in the universe. They can no longer interact with the other species. They can no longer bump off of the, vote of the proton and the electron. And so they're just going to go out and travel freely in the universe. How hot would plasma have to get for hydrogen atoms to come apart? Uh, let me calculate that. It would have to be pretty hot. I honestly cannot remember off the top of my head these numbers, but it, it's, um, let me think. We could basically calculate what energy scales has happened, but I cannot do the calculation in the top of my head. But you would have to get quite hot. You know, ripping off an, ripping off an electron from an atom is something that we can actually do pretty easily. It's something that happens very commonly, especially with the like photoelectric effect. You start to shine a light on a hydrogen atom, and you can actually rip away the electron. So this is actually something. This is actually something that we can calculate. I just got distracted by the comments there. I see we have a flat Earth in our mists. So um, genu genuine comment here. I really do think you're in the wrong broadcast. I don't think you're going to learn anything in this broadcast. I really don't think there's any point you wasting your time and my time in this comment, so please feel free to head off. Unless you generally do want to learn about actual science and actual scientific research, then please do stay. Okay. <coughs> what is an electron made of? That is a really, really great question. An electron is actually not really made of anything smaller. An electron is one of the basic building blocks within the universe. Now, the universe has some basic building blocks and some things that come together. For example, a proton is not a basic building block. It's not an elementary particle. A proton is made up of quarks. Now, these quarks are part of the basic building blocks. The quarks come together to form a proton. 
An electron, on the other hand, is one of the basic building blocks of the universe. So you can't break an electron down into its basic components. You can't break the electron down into something smaller because the electron is one of these building blocks, one of these subatomic elementary particles. So you cannot really break these electrons down any further. So what is an electron made of is a great question. We really can't answer that. It's made of an electron. An electron doesn't have base constituents. We can't really break it down further than, further than what it already is. But that is a very, very great question. So let me just gather my thoughts a second, carry on. OK, so early universe. We have these protons, we have these photons, we have these electrons. The electrons and the protons come together <coughs> to form hydrogen. The photons try to interact, they no longer can, so they break away and they start traveling freely throughout the universe. Now, this is something that has been predicted as part of the standard Big Bang cosmology. This is something that was predicted initially in 19, 1948. I have my cheat sheet here because I can never remember dates. 1948 and then 1950 were the first predictions of this light that broke away. Now, once this light breaks away, it forms what is called the last scattering surface. So the last point in the universe at which these photons could interact with the protons and the electrons. And these photons have been traveling freely ever since, traveling throughout the universe. Now, due to the expansion of the universe, these photons are gradually getting less energetic which means by now they've been redshifted to the point where they're in the microwave, band, the microwave band of the electromagnetic frequency, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Let me try that again. They're in the microwave frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. So these are particles of light that have been traveling within the universe since this surface of last scattering, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and they've been propagating freely in the universe since then. This means that we should actually be able to see them today. These photons of light have been traveling throughout the universe all the time. Since 380,000 years after the Big Bang, they are still traveling throughout the universe, gradually losing their energy, getting more and more redshifted, and they should be everywhere around us in any direction we look. And this is what makes up the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB. Cosmic, because it comes from the cosmos, microwave, because it's in the microwave range, and background, because it's in any direction we look. You saw that at high school 30 years ago, they taught us that electrons were made of three quarks. Uh, I, you might be misremembering there, Scott, because what is made of three quarks is actually the protons and the neutrons. So protons are made of two up from one down. Neutrons are made up of two down and one up quarks. So protons and neutrons are made of three quarks, but electrons themselves are one of the elementary particles. They actually usually have an image uploaded and I actually don't have this image uploaded today. Let me just upload it because this image will really help help answer that question. Okay, it should be here now. So this image here is the standard model of particle physics. These are all of the main building blocks we have in our universe. These are the basic constituents. You can see in purple we have the quarks. I was just trying to move my cursor over to show you. Remember you can't see my cursor. In purple we have the quarks. In green, we have the leptons, and in red, you have the bosons. The bosons are the ones that tell everything else how to behave. Now, the quarks can exist by themselves, so the quarks are always in groups of two or three, but the leptons can exist by themselves. So anytime you have a proton, you have a combination of up and down quarks. When you have a neutron, you have a combination of up and down quarks. But your, the electron, you see, is one of these building blocks. It's one of the pieces that we can play with in the universe. So what you're remembering there, Scott, that's made up of three components is the proton and the neutron. OK, so we have this nice image of the cosmic microwave background being produced in the early universe, propagating freely throughout the universe and reaching us today. So this was predicted in 1948 and in 1950 as a cornerstone prediction of the Big Bang cosmology. At the time, there was a question of how can we actually go about measuring this? How can we test this prediction of our Big Bang cosmology? And now I want to fast forward to 1964. 1964 and two scientists named Penzias and Wilson. Penzias and Wilson were trying to measure different parts of the, of the night sky. They had a really nice telescope. And they noticed when they looked at their data that they had kind of a background noise that they couldn't get rid of. 
no matter how they tried to tweak and turn their telescope, there was always this background light that was kind of bothering them. And they actually, funny story, they actually thought that maybe their telescope was dirty and maybe there were pigeon droppings on their telescope. So they went out and cleaned the telescope, cleaned everything, like no telescope is perfectly clean, check the sky again, and they were still getting this background glow, this background signal in their telescope. So at that point, they, they got on the phone to the theoretical physicist, like, hey, why am I seeing this background light everywhere in the universe? And the theoretical physicist said, wait, no, this is something we expect. We're hoping to see this. This is the CMB. So this was the first discovery of the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, accidental discovery by Penzias and Wilson in 1964. They subsequently won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1978. Now, some people are a bit unhappy, the fact that it was an accidental discovery, but regardless, it was still an amazing discovery. This was scientific evidence for the Big Bang model. This was really proof for the Big Bang cosmology. First proof. Okay, so this is 1964. 1964, we've now found proof of the CMB. But then around the 70s, so theoretical, you know, feel free to ask me any questions. If I'm getting too technical or anything, just jump in, ask me questions. I'm very happy to answer and discuss more with you. So all of the elementary particles have existed forever. Is it a finite quantity? Not necessarily. So not all of them have existed forever. Most of the hydrogen in the universe has been around since the beginning of the time. So since the early, not the beginning of time, sorry, since the very early cosmos, the very early universe. The protons, for example, were formed about three minutes after the Big Bang. The electrons, we believe, were formed at a similar time. And then higher, higher elements, heavier elements, such as helium, were formed a bit later in the universe. Lithium, beryllium, oxygen, chiron, all of these are formed later in the universe. But pretty much every atom in your body has been around for a very long time. Like all of the carbon in your body was formed inside a star. All of the hydrogen inside of you was formed three minutes after the Big Bang. So not only are you stardust, you're, all, you're also kind of like cosmic dust from the very, very early stages of, of the universe. There is residue Big Bang dust within you. So all of the elementary particles have existed. We, can, we do know of ways to kind of create more. You can have decays, for example, you can have some particles that decay into other particles. But pretty much a lot of the atoms and these main elements have existed for a long time. <coughs> I know protons and neutrons are, are obvious there. I just couldn't remember if they told us electrons were too. Yeah, you didn't have the standard, of the standard model of particles in your books. The standard model of particles has changed a lot over the last, I believe, 50 years. But it is pretty well established now. This is, these are our 17 building blocks that we know of to make up everything in the observable part of the universe. The standard model of particle physics won't tell you anything about dark matter yet. Okay, so in the 1970s, we have our prediction of the Big Bang. We have, we have our prediction of the CMB from the Big Bang. Hey, Alan, thank you for the high award. Nice to see you here. So we have the prediction and observation of the CMB. And now scientists started thinking, okay, how do we explain that there are galaxies in the universe? How do we explain that there is structure? Why do things come together to form structures? So back to, back to the early universe. And now I want to go back to the very early universe. This is the explanation that people came up for structures. Now in the very, very, very early universe, the universe was in this really hot, dense state where everything was completely compact together. And at this point, the whole universe was really, really, really tiny. So tiny that it was actually governed by quantum effects. So what you had in the very early universe were quantum fluctuations. Now quantum fluctuation sounds like a really scary concept, but I want you to think of a wave traveling on any surface. Like you hit the water, there are waves going out in the ripples. And you can see this specific frequency. You can see the wavelength. You can see there are mountains and, and valleys. There are mountains and valleys corresponding to the wave. And this wave has an oscillation. It has a frequency. So when we talk about fluctuations or oscillations, what we basically mean is something vibrating. Now in the very, very early universe, it's so tiny that you have these quantum variations, these tiny fluctuations. Now, as the universe expanded, these quantum fluctuations expanded as well. So you can imagine that these are really fluctuations of space-time itself. And these were really, really tiny in the early universe. As the universe expanded, these quantum oscillations got stretched. 
This means that by the time 380,000 years after the Big Bang, by the time you have the protons, the electrons, the photons, and the dark matter here in the universe, you have these fluctuations, these quantum oscillations stretched out to cosmic scales. This means that there are regions of space-time where there's going to be an over-density of space-time and regions where there's going to be an under-density. So you can imagine that the universe, instead of being a flat fabric like we're used to, actually has kind of mountains and valleys all across it from where these quantum fluctuations were stretched. Now, at this point, we know that the dark matter is not interacting with anything else, but the dark matter does feel the gravitational force. So the dark matter is going to start clustering inside the valleys of this these valleys formed from the quantum fluctuations. Dark matter will attract things gravitationally, which means that the protons, the electrons, these are also going to start kind of falling into the valleys. So if you imagine space-time as being kind of this bubbly, not really bubbly, but this place with lots of mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys, most of the matter in the early universe was living within the valleys. So when the protons and the electrons started to combine together and the photons broke away, these photons first had to climb out of a valley before they could travel towards us. This means that even though we expect this background radiation to be at the same temperature everywhere in the universe, we actually expect these tiny, tiny differences because the photons that had to climb out of the valley have lost a bit more energy than the photons that started on one of the mountains, which means when these photons, these particles of light reach you, some will be slightly more energetic than others. <coughs> And if you want to form structures in the universe, the photons are now traveling, doing their own thing, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. You still have these valleys, and inside these valleys, you have dark matter and now hydrogen. And if you put enough hydrogen in one place, you can actually form a star. Once you have stars in the dark matter, you can condense them all together and start forming galaxies. So this picture of these quantum fluctuations lets you, lets you tell a story from the very early universe going through the Big Bang sorry, through the CMV to the galaxies that we see in our night sky today. And this was predicted in the 70s. So at this point, there was the question of, okay, let's go and measure this. We've been able to see that there's this background light in the universe. Now we really want to go and see if there are tiny, tiny differences in this background light in any direction that we look. So what do we do? We build a, we build a spacecraft. Here on Earth, there's too much contamination, there's too much light. We have to think that this is really, really faint light. This is the afterglow of the Big Bang we're trying to detect. There's just too much noise to detect it down here on Earth. There's too many lights, too much interference from everything else. In order to detect this faint afterglow of the Big Bang, we need to go to space. So what do we do? We build a satellite. Now, I should mention here, just, just so we're all on the same page, this CMB is in every direction around us, which means it basically forms a sphere around us, sphere traveling towards us. In any direction we look, we should be able to get this measurement. So, in 1989, the first CMB mission was launched. Now, the first CMB mission was called COBE, that standard for Cosmic Background Explorer. It was a NASA-sponsored mission. It launched in 1989 and it was in operation until 1993. So this was the first CMB mission ever. It set out to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation and to see if there were these tiny, tiny, tiny temperature differences. So what did it measure? Let me show you what it measured. This here is the very first image from the COBE satellite. This is the first image we ever had of the cosmic microwave background radiation. The different colors here correspond to very slight different temperatures. Pink regions are hotter, blue regions are colder. Um, this was an absolutely remarkable discovery. This here really shows us that not only is the CMB real, yay for the Big Bang, it also has these tiny temperature differences, which means we actually understand how structures form in the universe. We understand how galaxies form in the universe. This image was sent back in 1990, th um, 31 years ago by now, and it was the first image ever of the CMB. Um, this image, this satellite, the leaders of this mission actually won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for basically throwing us into a whole new era of cosmology, because now we can actually really see the CMB, the, big, the leftover afterglow from the Big Bang. And I just want to make a clarifying comment here because I said that the CMB 
Asian sphere all the way around us. Um, you might wonder why this image looks like an, an opal shape, kind of like an oblong instead of a sphere. So I just want to mention that this is what we call a hammer projection. This is a way of projecting a sphere into kind of a two-dimensional space. Um, I can show you also what this would look like if we did the same to the Earth. I'm going to get an image stuck here. So if we did the same to the Earth, this is what we would see. So you know, we know the Earth is a sphere. If you do a hammer projection of the Earth, this is what you would see. If, on the other hand, you do a hammer projection of the data from Kobe, this is what you get. Um, I, I cannot state enough how amazing this was. This was the first image ever of the CMB, of the cosmic microwave background radiation. But this was in 1990. And um, this was good, but it wasn't quite good enough because we can see that there are these temperature differences. But scientists expected, so more distorted towards the edges, exactly. It's slightly more distorted towards the edges. Let me just bring back the one we're familiar with. If you compare it to the one you're used to, it's slightly more distorted. You can actually look at the, look at the grid lines here to see how everything is shifted slightly. But yeah, it's slightly more distorted to the edges, but it is one way of visualizing a sphere around us. It's one way of really visualizing the sphere that is around us. There are a lot of these hammer projections of the Earth as well. I Personally, I actually like it more than the, the standard rectangular one. It really gives me more of the image that it's on the sphere. But that, that's just me. So this image of, from Kobe of the CMB was good, but it wasn't good enough because you can see, you know, there's pink splotches, there's blue splotches, but our predictions were that these would be much, much, much smaller. So what we realized here is that we didn't have enough resolution. We needed another satellite. And then comes in WMAP. WMAP was the follow-up to Kobe. WMAP stands for the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. It was initially just called the the microwave anisotropy probe, anisotropy means these tiny, tiny temperature differences. But one of the lead scientists on the mission was Wilkinson, and he actually passed away in 2002. So the satellite was renamed WMAP in his honor, Wilkinson, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. This launched in 2001 and produced the first image for us of the CMB in a bit higher resolution. We got this image in 2002. So the other one was in 1990. This one was in 2002. I, I might have got those mixed up just now. And this is the first image we had from the WMAP satellite. And you can already see here that our temperature differences are now a lot smaller. You can really get more and more and more detail here. So this showed us that we're on the right track. You know, We know that these tiny differences are there and we can actually measure them. So the WMAP mission ran between 2001 and 2010. It was also funded by NASA. This image here that I'm showing you is from the first data release, but they ran for nine years. So we also have an image of the nine year data. I'm just gonna bring up the nine year data here. And now there's way too many things on the screen. So let me get rid of this one. Okay, so the big one you see here now is a nine year data. And you can see that it has such incredible precision. You know, it's really pushing this further and further. It's really allowing us to get these tiny temperature differences. So again, this is really measuring tiny, tiny, tiny temperature differences. I should mention just how tiny. So we know that the CMB is at an average temperature of 2.7 degree Kelvin. The differences we're talking about here are of the order of 10 to the minus five. That means it's 0 0.00001 Kelvin plus or minus. So we're talking about a temperature that you wouldn't be able to measure with any standard thermometer you buy down here. It's a, a ten thousandth of a degree, ten thousand, no, a hundred thousandth of a degree difference in these tiny, tiny particles of light everywhere in the universe. And these tiny temperature differences solidify the Big Bang cosmology as the standard model of cosmology. It really solidifies our explanation. This convinces us that we can really tell this picture between the early universe going through the formation of the CMB to the formation of galaxies in the universe. We know how all of this fits together. We can explain all of this. Not only that, if we had enough precision, is the expectation that it would be very textured or blotchy without a lot of small scale changes? I'm so glad you asked that. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because this is not the final map I'm going to show you. So what we expect is here to be more small scale precision. So here we're seeing stuff that is still a bit smeared out. This is as if you, you have the wrong prescription on your glasses. You can mostly see things, 
but they're slightly blurry. And we know that this is a slightly blurry version of the CMB. But this is the WMAP nine year data. And from this, not only does this solidify the, the standard Big Bang, the, the Big Bang model as a standard cosmological model, but it really, really allows us to start understanding more about the universe. And I'll get to that. So scientists saw this and thought, this is still not enough. We need more precision. We need to be able to see this with perfect vision. And in comes the Planck satellite. Now, the Planck satellite was launched in 2019 by the European Space Agency. All of these are satellites that we launch into space. 2009, sorry, I said 2019, no. 2009, the Planck satellite was launched. Its only mission was to measure these tiny, tiny, tiny fluctuations to incredible precision. Now, this satellite operated between 2009 and 2013. Um, the amount of data it sent back is absolutely incredible. So we got the, the data in 2013, and it took a while to actually clean it and, and release the data and make it nice enough and clean enough to go out, not just cleaning it, but actually really understanding it. Um, yeah, we got the data in 2012, 2013. The first release from Planck was in 2013. And let me bring it up now. This is the Planck 2013 data. And here you can start to really see the precision we're aiming for. This is nice precision. Here you really get to these tiny small scales. So Paul mentioned about the small scale change. This is the kind of precision we're aiming for. The Planck CMB data, 2013. But this was not the end, because the amount of data that we got from Planck was so incredible that it took five years to actually go through the data, understand the data, and prepare the data, turn the raw data into these images. And I was actually very lucky. I got to join the Planck collaboration in 2017, which meant I got to work on the final data release for Planck. So what you see here on the screen is 2013. This is not the end of the story. The final, final picture we have from the CMB, let me do it properly this time, and I'm going to get rid of WMAP, and I'm going to bring up the final 2018 Planck data. And it might look very similar to the 2013 one, but it has so much precision. This is absolutely incredible precision. This is the most detailed map of the cosmos ever. And just a reminder that we're looking here at the afterglow of the Big Bang. This is light that was produced 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And it's been traveling through the universe for 13 billion years to reach us, 13 and a half billion years to reach our satellite today and provide this incredible picture of these photons that came from the early universe. Um, I was very, very happy to be involved in the last release of the Planck data. Um, this is the final image from Planck. This is the tiny differences in the temperature we have in, in this early universe, this after, afterglow of the Big Bang, this light has traveled towards us, and we have these tiny, tiny, tiny temperature differences of the order of 0 0.0001 Kelvin. And we're able to measure it with this level of precision. This is absolutely incredible. We are the first generation, generation of humans ever to have the, this precision and this map. If you cross your eyes, is it a magic picture? I don't think so. I believe me, I've tried. I've tried to find so many things in the CMB. Unfortunately, it's not a magic picture. There was actually a jokey first of April paper, April first paper at some point that um, you, you could actually find the the initials SH in here. So someone was saying Stephen Hawking's initials are in the CMB. If you look hard enough, you can start drawing pictures and, and find anything. Same question, if we had even more precision, would we expect a lot of fine, fine scale variation or not a lot of change? At this point, we don't expect much more change in terms of the temperature. So we really do think that not only is this as best as we can do, this is the best that there is. This is really, really, really heading to this small, tiny scale precision. We don't expect it to change much more in terms of the temperature. As usual in my broadcast, I make an, an infusion when I, before starting, and then 45 minutes later, I realize I have a cold infusion here. Hey, Molly, nice to see you. Thank you for joining. So I, I really like the follow-up question there of will there be more missions and the question that Paul is asking. So let me get to that in a minute. But first of all, I just want to remind you how far we've come here. 
really how far we've come from the beginning. Let me bring that up and get rid of myself here. So compare the Kobe one to the Planck one. Kobe, this is in the wrong order. Kobe in 1990 on Planck 2018. This is the level of precision we've gained over the last 30 years in terms of CMB missions. And this is absolutely incredible. And now we've pushed the temperature to its limit. But the temperature is not the only information within the CMB. There is also information in the form of the direction in which these photons are traveling. The direction in which these photons are traveling is known as the polarization. And with the polarization of the CMB, this is what we have. This is the polarization of the CMB. This tell, you can, can see here the little black arrows. This shows you in which direction these photons were vibrating on their path towards us. So the question, what is next for the CMB? It's expected that we still can do a little bit better with the temperature precision. We can, I, I said before, we're not, this is not going to change, but actually it is, it is going to change. So we do expect to get even more small scale precision. And we expect to be able to get so much more information out of the polarization, the, the direction in which these were vibrating. Now, all of the missions up till now have been optimized, designed exclusively to find this image. But the polarization was not the main target, but it is going to be now. So there are currently three or four missions ongoing, focusing on studying the polarization of the CMB. This includes the Atacama Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, these are ground-based missions, and rather than trying to get the whole sky, they focus on a smaller region of the sky. The idea being here, if you, smoke, if you focus on a smaller region, you can get more detail. If you focus on the whole sky, you lose a bit of detail. Hey, David, hey, Abyss, nice to see you both. Thank you both for being here. So there's also what is known as CMB Stage 4 and the Simons Observatory. These are two ground-based missions that are measuring the CMB hoping to get even more precision than what Planck had. Now, the difference here is that these don't have to go to, they're not going to space, so they will have more nuisance parameters, more noise in their mission, but they get to focus on a smaller region of the sky, which means they can really zoom in more. You have to choose, either you get a big sky range and less accuracy, or a small sky range with huge accuracy. We've already got the full sky survey from Planck. Now there's a next generation of CMB missions, CMBS-4, the Simons Observatory, plus all of the polarization missions that are zooming in on a small region of the sky and pushing our precision even more. Okay, so this has been the whirlwind introduction of what is the CMB. Excellent question from David. Does the theory suggest the variation must be random or could it be based on something? I am so glad you asked that question because that question really sets up what I'm gonna say now. So this, this is a pretty picture. You know, we have this nice picture of the CMB, it's kind of pretty. But this by itself is not the main thing. We, we are really interested in analyzing these temperature differences. It's not just about having this pretty picture, although the pretty picture is kind of a pretty picture. It's really about understanding these tiny temperature differences. And this is where we have to take the spectrum of the CMB. So just, just as an idea what I mean about taking the spectrum. Imagine you play a musical instrument and you play a note on your musical instrument. Now you know that this note can be decomposed into its base frequencies. It's going to be a sum of different frequencies. Any note that you hear, you can decompose into a sum of different frequencies. Another way of thinking about it, imagine you, you have a picture and you pick up a specific color. Now on most systems, you break down these colors into a combination of red, blue and green. There is a certain amount of red, a certain amount of blue, a certain amount of green. You know that one specific combination leads to that exact color that you see. So when we take the spectrum of the CMB, what we really do is we count not just which ones are blue and orange, which ones are cold and hot, but the statistical properties. So how many blue photons are there? How many orange photons? Now they're not literally blue and orange, they're hot and cold. So how many of the hot regions are there? How many of the cold regions are there? And how big are these regions? You know, how big is the, the hottest region? How big is the coldest region? And then we ask the question, like if I break the sky into two and I focus just on what we call the dipole, what's the kind of, so I, I average this out over two patches, what's the overall distribution? And then you might average it out over four patches or over 10 patches or over 50 patches. So each time your patch is getting smaller and each time you get a different amount of blue and orange. 
So here the question is, you know, at which this corresponds to which scales? We call them scales. If you look at large scales, you're taking the whole thing. When you go to small scale, scales, you're really taking this fine grained picture. So while this picture is very, very nice, of course, what we actually want, let me just go back to picture and picture mode. What we really want is to take the spectral decomposition of the CMB. And we have been able to do this. Obviously, this is what I've been leading up to. What you see here is the spectral decomposition of the CMB. On the vertical axis, you can see these temperature fluctuations. This is basically the amount of hot spots that we have in the CMB versus cold spots. And in the vertical axis, you can see two things. If you focus on the top, it's phrased as multipole, which is the scientific word. And if you focus on the bottom, there's a one that's more easy to understand, which is the angular scale. If you look at patches that cover 90 degree on the sky, you're on large scales and you can go all the way down to like 0 0.05 degrees on the sky. In fact, let me just put this in hero mode for one sec. <coughs> yeah, this is the full fingerprints of the CMB. The red dots here correspond to the actual data extracted from our CMB map. So every red dot here is a data point that we have been able to take from our CMB map. And the green line going through it is our prediction. So let me just rewind here. If we just have the red dots, it doesn't really tell us much. So we need the other part of the story. And for this, we need to make a prediction of, based on what I think the laws of the physics, laws of physics are like in the universe, and based on my knowledge of the universe, what would I expect this spectrum to look like? And this is something that we are actually able to do now. This is something that we know how to do. And we have developed over the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, we have developed cosmological codes that can simulate 13 and a half billion years of cosmic evolution at the click of a button. And this code literally takes one second to run. If you bring up your code, you tell it, this is a cosmological model that I think describes the universe. And these are the specific numbers I want to give in to my model. You hit play and the code will spit out the spectrum of the CMB, the predicted spectrum, based on what you expect, what you gave it as an input. If you give it an input that says, for example, the universe is made entirely of normal matter, there is no dark matter, there is no dark energy, you spit out the green curve, it will not lie along these red dots, not at all. So the game us cosmologists like to play is trying to find which green line best describes every red dot that you see here. Which green line can go through all of them? And because we're kind of smart, we, we sometimes we try to be, we have good guesses as to what you might change. We know, for an example, if you change the amount of dark matter in the universe, you mess up the first and the third peak. If you change the time at which stars began to form in the universe, you move everything a bit. So we know how the green line changes based on your components of the universe. So we've played this game thousands of times, billions of times. We run complicated simulations where we tell our computer, call my code a, th a million times for a million different input parameters and find which cosmological model goes through all of these red dots with the least error. And we've done this and what it's spat out is our standard Lambda CDM cosmology. This tells us that the universe is made up of dark matter, dark energy and normal matter. The universe is flat. The universe is 13.82 billion years old. Stars began to form at redshift 7, which means 100 million years after the Big Bang. All of this information is encoded within the CMB. And if you try to change any of these numbers, if you try to say there's 28% dark matter instead of 26% dark matter, you will not be able to reproduce this data. And I actually am planning to do a broadcast. Let me just check my um, CPU usage here on HAPS. It's not great. Okay, so I'm planning on doing my next broadcast as an interactive game where I'm going to set up my code. Um, we're actually going to try to, to describe this green line. So I'm going to ask you which, which parameter of the universe should we change? And we're going to try to see how accurately we can get these data points. So I do have this interactive broadcast set up or planned. It will probably be my next broadcast. And then you will get to help me be a cosmologist and find which cosmology tells us about the universe. But we really need to go through all of these red data points. And I, I really can't state enough how amazing this is. We've been able to get this picture of the CMB. I know there are a couple of questions. I'll get to them in a sec. 
we've been able to get this picture of the CMB, which proves the Big Bang model. Well, not really proves, but it's evidence for the Big Bang model. It was a prediction that was made and that now we've observed. You know, it's something that we have, something that we've been able to observe with incredible precision. And now we can use this to actually get the components of the universe. We now know the universe has dark matter, it has dark energy, it has normal matter. In approximately, I'm not giving you the exact numbers because that will give away the game. We know that normal matter is about 5%, dark energy is about 70%. Dark matter is about 25% of the universe. Universe is flat, 13.82 billion years old. All of this is encoded within this picture here. We also know that the universe in its early stages was dominated by radiation like the inside of a star. We know there was an era in the universe where structures dominated. We know that currently the universe is dominated by dark energy and it's expanding even faster than it was in the past. And we are the first generations of humans ever to, to get this map, to actually see this, to be able to understand this. Um, this is just absolutely amazing. You know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, physicists were dreaming of this. They were dreaming of measuring the CMB. And now we actually have the CMB. We've measured it to incredible precision, to less than 1% precision. And we are the first people to ever do this. And it is absolutely amazing. So people might have heard me on these podcasts talk often about the CMB. I have a mug with the CMB on it. I have a shirt with the CMB on it. And I hope I've convinced you today that the CMB is just that really the holy grail of cosmology. So there were some excellent questions here. The first one was there were very big error bars at the wide angles. This is a great observation, David, and it's completely true. So you'll notice that every red dot has some lines around it. This shows us the degree of belief in the red dot means this is where we think the red dot is, but it's somewhere in between these error bars. Now, at high angular scales, the error bars are much larger. And one way to think about this is how many ways can you cut up this map and get a 90 degree patch? There's not so many, right? You basically only have two, three, maybe four patches you can play with at most. Four would be reasonable. You don't have many more. So, this, this is what we're limited by here, is what is known as being limited by, on the one hand, cosmic variance, that we only have one universe to play with. Now we're talking about the overall statistical properties of the universe, which means we deal with averages. Now ideally here, we would need five, six, seven universes to get more accuracy. When we go to much smaller scales or smaller angles on the sky, so higher multiple moments, you have many more to test. You can find many patches in the sky that cover one degree, but you can't find that many that cover 10 degrees or 90 degrees. So the bigger the patch you want, the fewer samples you have to deal with. Ideally, we would have 20 universes, you measure this 20 times, and then you would shrink the error bars here. But this is why you see that as we go to higher and higher position, the error bars shrink. So on small, on big angular scales here, so on larger angular scales, you really are limited by the, the fact that we only have one, one universe. And on really small angular scales, we're limited by the satellite position. Are the multi so let me see other comments say that's a big percentage of the sky. Yeah, yeah, it, it is a big percentage of the sky. But yeah, that, that is um, why we have these big error bars there. Yeah, there was a great comment by David. Yes, just clarifying that as well. Are the multiples similar to complex poles from control theory? The multiples actually come about when you do the Fourier decomposition. So just getting a bit technical here, when we measure the sky, we always do a two point correlation function. So we look at two different points on the sky and how they're statistically correlated. And then you do the breakdown. You go to Fourier space, you do the breakdown and the multipole moment is just a way of kind of quantifying how we actually do this correlation. So I, I normally just focus on angular scales because it's much easier to explain multiple gets, gets a bit difficult to explain. Why would light from the Big Bang be polarized instead of random? So it is random. This is the idea that every photon can travel in one specific direction, right? In any specific direction, unless there's some physics that kind of forces it to be polarized. What could force it to be polarized? Lots of things. For an example, if you have an early period of accelerated expansion in the universe known as inflation, this could actually lead a very specific imprint on the polarization of the CMB. 
Now, we would not see this in the normal polarization that I showed you, but in a different type of polarization. What I showed you is the E mode polarization. There's another type of polarization known as the B mode. The B mode polarization could give us information about what actually caused the universe to expand in the very early universe and this accelerated expansion that we experience in the early universe. Planck could not measure the B modes. There are missions planned like Lightbird to measure the B modes. But yeah, what causes this polarization? So you might notice in the image, let me bring it up again here. Uh, this is the one we want. This is, this is the polarization. And I wanted to put it in here mode. Let me just put it in here mode slightly. You'll notice here in the polarization that it does look like everyone is kind of random. You can't really find patterns here. A big effort is going into trying to find different patterns because this polarization would actually tell us a lot. So naively, or not naively, sorry, but a priori, we would expect this to be completely random. And if we find anything that's not random, that gives us hints and evidence of, you know, what could have made it not random. You see that it's not all along one direction. So there is largely this random polarization to the light, but any place where there is not this random polarization is a place where we can hope to find something cool. So there are missions now focusing specifically on the polarization of the CMB, really hoping to push this precision to really un answer your question of what's causing the polarization of the CMB. We can predict this in the same way we can predict the temperature anisotropy. For a given model, you can predict how polarized it would be. And that's something else that your cosmology code can spit out. Currently, the polarization map of the CMB paints exactly the same picture as the temperature one. It's really nice. The same cosmological model that describes the temperature of the CMB actually perfectly describes what we've observed for the polarization of the CMB. This was a remarkably good cross check. Like you can really get the temperature, calculate the best cosmological model, use that model to predict the polarization, overlay the data point of the polarization, and it is perfect. And you can do that in both directions. So this is a really, really good cross check of how accurate this data really is. If we get it right, does your HAPS audience get to share the Nobel Prize? That would be really nice. The thing is, we already know the answer. I already know the answer. You know, it's already publicly available information. We're going to play about so you can actually see for yourselves why this is the correct answer. But unfortunately, I don't think we'll win the Nobel Prize. Maybe if we find a better answer to the one that other people have found to the current accepted model. If you can find a model that fits the data even better than the standard cosmological model, that would be nice. That's the objective for everybody. As to when will that be? I'm actually not sure. I'm actually very much not sure right now. Uh, it will, at the latest, it would be next weekend. But I do actually have Thursday and potentially Friday off. I'm not sure. So maybe it will be sooner. I will announce this interactive broadcast. I really think it's going to be fun. So um, I, I really do think it will be fun. I do actually need to set it up because currently I have my code, but it's not in a format that you kind of understand what it's doing. So I do need a bit of preparation time. But probably the, my idea was that today I introduced the CMV and next week we get to play and actually try to predict the, the correct spectrum for the CMV. <clears throat> and I've been monitoring my CPU usage, it's kind of high, but I think my code should still be able to handle it. Maybe instead of one second, it would take two seconds. It should still be pretty fast. 20 universes with 20 Dianas working on it should give us a very precise measurement. I'd hope so. I can imagine that if there are 20 versions of me, maybe not all of them would work on the CMB, but I think they might because the CMB is you might have noticed in this broadcast, I love the CMB. What's not to love? This is such an amazing, such an amazing thing that we have, that we can actually measure the CMB, that we have this data, that we have these pictures, not just of the CMB, but of the fingerprint of the universe. It's absolutely amazing. So yeah, I think there would be, maybe if there are over 20 Dianas, like 10 will be working on gravitational waves and 10 on CMB maybe. But yeah, then maybe we get to the answer faster. B mode in TLC and B polarization from inflationary gravitational waves. Yes, exactly. If we were to measure B mode polarization in the CMB, it would show us that there was a background of gravitational waves in the universe produced by this primordial inflationary e epoch. And yeah, measuring primordial gravitational waves. So we've measured gravitational waves coming from black holes smashing together. Amazing. We've measured gravitational waves coming from neutron stars smashing together, also amazing. 
one objective for future gravitational wave missions. So thank you for the appreciate your word, David. I really appreciate your words. So there are future missions planned, such as the LISA mission, which is going to be sent to space, and it's planned to try to measure this background gravitational wave signal. So in the same way we have the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, it's expected that there's a background of gravitational waves in our universe. And that is a big thing to measure in the future. And you've seen how excited I am about the CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation. The day we measure, the, if, if we ever measure the gravitational wave background, that's going to be absolutely incredible. LISA, the mission plan for this, LISA, is set to fly in 2034. I am hopeful. I am very hopeful that we will get the gravitational wave background. That's going to be fun. Would any of those 20 Dianas be singing and dancing? Not publicly, no. You can very much expect all of them would be singing while cooking, but never on a broadcast. You, you really don't want to hear me sing and dance on a broadcast. It's just not going to happen. You know, please don't waste your dance awards on me because I will not break into dance. I think it would be great to see your code simulating angular scale. I don't know if you have access to a remote server. That could be an option to running on your computer. I do have access to a remote server. The problem with running on remote servers is there's usually less of a graphical interface. So usually to do my big simulations, I do run on a remote server. I think for doing the type of test we're going to do, it should just be simple, relatively simple calculations for the code. My computer should manage. I actually got this computer specifically to do such things. And you know, I frequently have it running for days doing stuff. So my, my computer should be able to deal with this. It's just a question of how much resources HAPS is using and how much my code will use. Worst case scenario, I'll just turn off my video for a while while, while we have the code up. I think it will be fine. Um, and I think it will, will, I will manage to get it working. Cosmology explains through the medium of interpretive dance. Uh, well, I would not be the first one. There are actually people who do this. There was there was a dance a dance project a couple of years ago. I think it was called Dancing with the Stars. No, not Dancing with the Stars. It's something else. There was something else. It was something like the I really cannot remember the name. In any case, it was one person who were the one physicist, astrophysicist who was commenting on this was Paul Sutter. And the idea was it was telling the history of the universe through interpretive dance. Absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, not something you're going to see me doing. If I start dancing, I'm just going to fall over and smack my face on a wall, which I'm sure would be funny to everybody. But let's just stick to me sat down in a chair discussing things with you. It's a lot easier than, um, than dancing with main sequence stars. Yeah, I mean, I really can't remember the name of the program. I'll find it and send out a tweet about it. Yeah, running graphics on a remote server is atrocious. Couldn't agree more with you. So I actually, my plan is to use a Jupyter Notebook because a Jupyter Notebook offers both a very nice interface with my code and it's really visual where you can directly see what I'm doing. And I can give everything really nice names because in the code it's called like Omega, which means stuff to us. But then in the interface that we're going to use, it's actually going to be listed as like amount of dark matter in the universe. So it should be should be easier for everybody to, to play. And the idea is that everybody would be able to shout out a model that we tested and hopefully you don't break my code with random models that it doesn't know how to deal with. I do need a bit of tinkering for us to set that up, but that should be next weekend. That should be next Sunday at the latest. I will announce if there's any changes to that schedule. Okay, I see I've been rambling for a very long time as usual, but you know, CMB, how could I not talk about the CMB? I very much expected the CMB discussion to take the whole broadcast because once I get started on the CMB, there's no shutting me up. So hopefully today I've really convinced you as to why the CMB is so amazing and why it is the most amazing tool we have to study the universe. And even though we have this incredible precision for the CMB, it's not yet over. We're going to get better precision. We're going to get polarization. The CMB still has more information to tell us. And today I focused exclusively on things like temperature and polarization. There actually is a lot more information hidden in what is known as spectral distortions. And I'm leaving this as a teaser because I'm going to get one of my colleagues to join me soon and we'll do a broadcast entirely about spectral distortions. So today I'm purely leaving this as a teaser just to get your interest of what are spectral distortions. And I'll come back at some point and explain that. Do you use Matplotlib or other visualization tool? We'll probably be using Matplotlib for this. It's just the easiest, the quickest way to do it. 
at least for me. Once I have it set into a Jupyter notebook, Matplotlib is my is my go to. And um, I actually already have some plots ready, so it's just going to be changing the inputs. So yeah, we'll be we'll be using Matplotlib. But you know, my my full Jupyter notebook will be visible on the screen, so you'll get to see all of that, that as well. And I would be open to sharing the Jupyter notebook publicly if anybody wants that. A thank you for the award, David. I really do appreciate the awards. As I mentioned at the beginning, any award, any sponsorship, any money I get on HAPS, I will donate to organizations that promote science, that help get more people interested in science. I already did the first two donations based on everything you've all given me here on HAPS. I'm really deeply appreciative of all the support you show me. All of the awards up till now have been donated. I hope to do the same again soon not soon you know whenever we get there we get there when we get there but all of the money here on house will be donated so oh out of breath now that's an hour and 10 minutes just ranting about the cmb i love the cmb okay so thank you everybody for joining thank you for the high award a bit appreciate it so thank you everybody who's joined for the comments for the great questions and of course for the awards it's been really great fun i will be online again very soon i hope to see you next week uh, thank you for stopping by, David. I really appreciate you being here. And if you're interested in things about nature, go follow David as well. So actually, both Davids here. I see we have we have David Howden and David Dunn. Follow both of them. Both great people to podcast. Both great podcasters. Follow everybody here. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This really has been great fun. I hope to see you online next week. And in the meantime, I hope you all stay safe and take care of each other.